This morning we begin a new worship series entitled Living United. And just to be very, very honest with you, this is the time of the year where traditionally we begin our stewardship campaign. It's a time where we talk about what it means to have a full commitment in all of the areas of faith, discipleship, stewardship, financially, study, and growth. And so we are going to talk about what it means to be full followers of Jesus Christ. Before I begin this sermon this morning, I want to start by simply saying a great word of thanks to our congregation. Our church, through this pandemic, has been very generous and very faithful. You have supported well this annual operating budget, and as we speak, we are currently ahead of budget for 2020. Now, people say, don't tell them that they're ahead, they'll stop giving. But I don't believe that's true about this church. I believe that this is a faithful congregation that doesn't give because there's a a need necessarily. I believe when there is a need, this congregation is very generous. But I believe this is a congregation that's called to financial stewardship, to giving, to the act of tithing and first fruit giving. And I believe that this congregation will continue to do the good work to which it is called, to support the ministry and the mission of this church and the kingdom for God's call here on this earth. I simply want to say thank you because you have done well and you have run your race faithfully. So then what do we talk about during this month of stewardship? Well, quite frankly, We want to spend the next four weeks talking about what it means to be united. United is important. In fact, it's one of the names of our church, the United Methodist Church. Many of you may not know the history on why we are called United Methodist because it wasn't until about 40 years ago that we became the United Methodist Church. We originally, when we formed here, became what was known as Methodists, and there were fissures and breaks and different groups of people who followed a Wesleyan understanding of faith, started new denominations without the church. But back in the late 1960s, there were these two groups, the Methodist Church, which had been formed out of the union out of a northern Methodist church and a southern Methodist church, came together to be the Methodist church. And then in the late 1960s, the the Methodist church joined with our sisters and brothers from a church called the Evangelical United Brethren. And so we took our name Methodist, and we took United from the Evangelical United Brethren, And as we came together to form a new denomination comprised of these two great faith traditions, we became the United Methodist Church. And so today, together, assembled as a body of family of faith, behind the cross, set forth in mission together, we proudly proclaim that we are the United Methodist Church. However, there is question these days. Are we still a united church? Are we still a family of faith that covers the globe in many different nations? Are we united under one common mission, one common goal to offer Christ to the world? to experience God's love, and then to offer it to our sisters and brothers for the transformation of the world. And so for the next four weeks, we simply want to talk about what it means to live united. This morning we will be looking at Colossians chapter 2. And this morning we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. I'd encourage you to grab your Bibles and Turn to this section of the New Testament and follow along with me. Beginning at verse 1, 
Colossians chapter 2. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now we know that this letter of Colossians was a letter written by Paul to the church in Colossae. We know that Paul was a voracious missionary, that he went on three missionary journeys. And on, this, on one of these three journeys, Paul established and supported this church in Colossae. He knew that we know that he cared for the church and he loved them deeply. And so this morning, I believe Paul gives us kind of a, a foundational piece or a template for what it means to be united with a mission, a clear focus, and a call to be the church. Now, we need to first understand what Paul is saying in the very beginning of this section. He says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. Now, let me explain to you, if you don't already know, you can go back into the book of Acts, where a great bit of Paul's missionary journeys are described and capitulated. Paul did not have an easy life as a missionary. In fact, as you read through some of these missionary journeys, you will see that Paul experienced shipwreck. Paul experienced rejection at every turn. In one Galatian city, Paul was pulled out to the outskirts of the city he was stoned and dropped to the ground. Everyone thought that he was dead. But to the crowd's amazement, Paul stood back up, went back into the city, and continued to preach. When Paul says that I have agonized for you, these are not simply flowery words. These are not some kind of beautiful comment that Paul is making. Paul is saying, I have put my life on the line for you. Why is this so important? Because Paul, Paul who was at one time named Saul, the great persecutor of the movement of Christ, Paul who stood on the, the seat of authority as a great Pharisee, a religious leader, a skeptic of the Christ movement, himself was an outsider. Paul was one who did not yet know the beautiful, mysterious plan of Christ. In fact, he was an antagonist of that movement. And then one day, Paul comes to this radical moment, this 180-degree turn, through miraculous events and the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul's eyes were opened up from both spiritual and physical blindness to where he came for himself to understand the beautiful love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And in that moment, Paul made a decision. He made a decision to turn from a persecutor of Christ to receive Christ, and then to do nothing short of pour out the rest of his life. No matter what hardships it meant, no matter what pain it meant, no matter what scorn he endured, to tell others about Jesus. It was the single missional objective of his life. Now, Paul had a job. 
In fact, we know that he was a, a, a template for a bivocational minister. It says that Paul was a tent maker. Now, we don't know a whole lot about that, but we know that Paul had concerns for his financial well-being, where he would live, what he would eat. And these were all real concerns. Paul was a real human being. And all of those specters, all of those areas of Paul's life were in front of him. But in Paul's perspective, in Paul's missionary work, in Paul's understanding of his calling as a follower of Jesus Christ, they were all secondary to his understanding as a call to be a child of God. So Paul went. Paul ministered, and Paul agonized on behalf of those that did not yet know Christ. As I read this text this week and started preparing, this first little section, this first little sentence really hit me deeply. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I am one who walked in spiritual darkness had an opening to Christ, and now have moved into the place where I have given my life as a follower of Jesus Christ. I accepted a call to ministry, but that's not the big call in my life. That's my vocational work. The big call, the capital C call, was simply this, to love God to fully know God, and to make God fully known. You see, the Apostle Paul, the Pastor Micah, the layperson in the pew, the layperson watching on the computer screen today, we all share that common call, one with another. And it is nothing short of the call to make God fully known inside of the world. You see, the calling to share Christ isn't reserved for simply apostles or for pastors, or for worship leaders. But anyone who has come to know the love of Christ, anyone who has come to know the comfort of the forgiveness of sins, anyone who has come to experience the grace that comes by knowing that you don't have to be perfect, and that God himself laid his life down for you, receives the capital C call, to go and make disciples of all nations. And then I read these words that Paul agonized, Paul journeyed, Paul went. I had to, this week, sit there and ask myself, when was the last time that I agonized over someone who does not yet know Christ? When was the last time that I even felt discomfort for someone who is not inside of that nurturing, uh, nurturing grasp of the power of the Holy Spirit? When was the last time that I was uncomfortable, felt pain for the sake of the gospel so that someone else might have an opportunity to hear of the good news and the love of Jesus Christ. You see, I believe to live united starts with understanding our missional objective from the moment that we come to know the power of Christ in our life is simply to take that knowledge, to take that grace to the world and to share it with others. And if that's the call, then sometimes my life must be poured out. At times, I must sacrifice. There must be hardships. There must be a fire that burns within me that I understand that God is counting on me, counting on you, counting on us all to go out and share the good news. Jesus tells the story in the Gospels about these three different individuals that were each entrusted with talents. Two of those servants took their talents, took their gifts, and invested them, and those talents were multiplied. And Jesus says that the master came back 
to those two servants and said, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with little. Now you will be entrusted with much. One of those servants said, I knew that you expected much of me. And I was afraid. So I dug a hole in the ground and I buried that talent in the ground so that when you returned, I would simply hand you back what you entrusted to me. And the master of that field said, you are wicked. You've been lazy. You knew that I expected of you. And then he looked to his servants and he said, take that talent from that servant and give it to these over here because they understand the kingdom principle that to whom much is given, much is required. Might I simply start by saying our missional objective, the call of all of us who call Christ our Lord and Savior is to take the gifts, to take the good work, to take the talents that God has put inside of us and use them for multiplication inside the sake of the kingdom. Now that happens differently in each one of us. Not many of us will stand in a pulpit and preach. Not many of us will go out on street corners. But there are multitudes of ways that we can use those talents that have been invested into us by God himself to multiply them for the sake of replication in the kingdom. And unless you get confused by these words multiplication and replication, it's simply this, as the famous evangelist D.L. Drummond said, it's one beggar showing another beggar where to get a loaf of bread. You see, it's simply being us. It's simply living out of that place where God planted us the way he planted us for the sake of magnificent growth inside of the kingdom. And people's lives are at stake. To live united means that we take serious, we take serious our call of Christ to do the work that he's implanted in us already to do. Now, what's interesting is he says, I have agonized over you, and then he says this, and for the church at Laodicea. Now, you know this name, although it may be somewhat foreign to you. You've heard it before, Laodicea, Laodicea. Where have I heard this before? Well, the final book of the New Testament is the book called Revelation. And there are seven churches mentioned in Laodicea. This is the church that is Laodicea mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, what's very interesting, if you turn to Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the revelator reveals that there is a brokenness now in the church of Laodicea. And what is that brokenness? He says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. Instead, you are like lukewarm water. And now you must be spewed. You must be rejected. You must be spit out. You know, that's a really tough saying, isn't it? Hot or cold, but lukewarm, you must be spit out. Scholars have debated the meaning of this text for a long time, but understand that Paul is writing this letter to Laodicea prior to the reality that the church has become lukewarm. Very interesting that Laodicea's water source was sort of a stagnant water pool that would come in and it would fill into a a, a catchment basin and the water would simply stand there. It wasn't a a fresh running source in Laodicea, but rather a, a, a kind of stagnant warm pool. Now on one side of Laodicea was a town called Hierapolis. Hierapolis 
had a hot spring that sprung out with this thriving hot mineral water that was so good for health and well-being. On the other side of the city was another town called Colossae. And in Colossae, they had this vibrant living spring water that poured out fresh, pure, cool spring water that you could literally just dip into and drink from. And here's this town, Laodicea, that fully knows that its water source is not very good. And so often the people from Laodicea would travel to Hierapolis or Colossae, and they would see the vibrant drinking water, the vibrant mineral water that came from the two, two towns on either side of them, and yet Laodicea was stuck with this tepid, average, kind of gross water. And this is the picture of what Laodicea becomes. A church that's neither hot and vibrant for healthy living minerals, nor is it this cool running spring water that's wonderful to drink and refreshes the soul. It's just kind of become a, a water source that no one's very excited about. Paul is agonizing about the church saying, beware. Because there is a complacency that comes upon you. There is a tendency after that first taste of Christ and that heartwarming experience where, where the Lord descends to you and fills your heart that you must keep that temperature cooking. You must continue to take control and, and make sure the thermostat is right. Now there is this picture of hot and, and cold. And the reality of saying there is a, a vibrant spiritual life Someone who is at work in study, in mission, in serving, in giving. And then there's this second life that's cold. Not present spiritually whatsoever. And the revelator gives the picture of saying, you would be better off to be one or the other. Because the hot and vibrant life goes to work for the sake of the kingdom and trusted with gifts and uses them for the multiplication of the kingdom the second has not yet fully tasted of the Lord. The second is available and ready to hear when the timing of the Holy Spirit is just right. But if you're lukewarm, it's almost as if you've received a vaccine against spiritual vigor. It's almost as you've received an inoculation towards the work that you're called to do. And you've become okay with complacency. I fear that sometimes the 21st century church, not Broad Street, but the church in general is suffering with the reality of luke warmed spirit. Misunderstanding our missional objective in the single greatest source that we should be united behind and that is to make God fully known to the world. Paul particularizes this in verse 2. He says, I want them to be encouraged, the church in Laodicea. I want them to be encouraged. I want them to be knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this morning, I, I want us to be clear before we jump ahead too far that we understand why our missional objective is so important. We know that we all suffer or struggle with this desire for wealth. We all battle with this desire for untold fortunes. All of us would love to be able to amass for ourselves earthly gain so that we might be comfortable, so that we might be safe, so that we might protect it, even so that we might be able to give and to share and to do great things for the world. But if that is truly our desire, let us be clear that what Paul says, the greatest treasure, 
the greatest gift of all times, the mysterious plan of God, is literally Christ himself. The gift of God to all of humanity. And here's what's so beautiful. That single greatest gift, the most known treasure in, the, in all of human history, is a level playing field with the Son of God as the atonement for the world. This is the mysterious plan of God. Not that we would all have the same, not that we would all be uh, equal, even Stephen and fair in this world, but rather when it came to the understanding of grace, hope, forgiveness, truth, and life itself, that we would all be level at the foot of the cross through the person and work of Christ. You don't believe that this is a great treasure? Listen to what it says in Psalm 19 and 10. The very word of God is more precious than gold. Psalm 3 and 13 says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain knowledge, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. Listen to these words from Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your law as much as riches. I will study your commandments and I will reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decree and not forget your word. Do you know who wrote that? King David. At the time, King David was probably one of the richest men on the face of the earth. He had everything. And yet, what did he desire? God. That was his desire. You see, we can stuff anything of this world into all of the crevices of our life. And yet, without the fullest understanding of who God is and the wisdom gained by knowing the power of his Holy Spirit, we will forever be spiritually poor and we will constantly be seeking out treasure. Because the greatest treasure of all in God's mysterious plan is Christ himself. Those who know Christ are rich beyond measure. This brings us back to the missional objective of this world. Every single person desires, even if they know it or not, there is a spiritual reality deep within our heart desiring our place in that level place with our creator. You hear people talk about spirituality and, and mysticism. That's because everyone at the very core of our being was created by God and has a need to be with God. And through Christ, the doorway to that level foothold at the base of the cross, through Christ, is open to all people. To live united means that that's what we focus on. That's our missional objective. Now he closes this pericope by saying, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. I just want to read that one more time. I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Let's be clear. There are many well-crafted arguments against the gospel, against the person and work of Christ. There are many, many deceptions that are out there and the, pit, the, the traps and the pitfalls are deep and they come often. He says, though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. Just a few quick words about this deception trap that want to pull us away from this missional objective that we have as a church. The first is this. 
there is outright deception inside of the world today. And there are those that would care to lead you away. There are those that would care to offer something that is completely and totally false. And let me be clear. Anything, any opportunity, any, any message or mission that takes away from the gospel of Christ alone is a deception. It is a false gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. This is the truth. Anything added to that, anything taken away from that is a false gospel and a pitfall of life. And when we fall into those pitfalls, when we veer off track and are deceived, our hearts become stirred up because of that place that God had prepared for us in this level foot of the cross, now builds a barrier between us and the place where God desired for us to be with him. And it causes pain and distress. But may I suggest that massive deceptions are usually the outlier. They're usually not the norm. You see, I believe most deceptions come much more subtly than that. I believe they come more as distractions than deceptions. Distractions that want to take our attention and our focus away from that which is most important in our lives. I come back to Paul. Paul could have put all of his attention into tent making. Paul did not have to go on missionary journeys. Paul could have been a very happy tent maker. But instead, Paul's priority was always the gospel. And then tent making was a part of his vocational life that helped support the larger part of who he was. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should quit their jobs and be bivocational ministers. But I am saying that whatever you do in life, there should always be an umbrella of Christ that is primary in your life. If you are a business person, there should be integrity in that business because Christ gave you that gift, that talent, and he's asked you to invest that talent, that business, that gift for the sake of the kingdom. And as Christ uh, is the umbrella, the overlier over that work, then you continue to make God fully known. You begin to make an impact for the sake of the kingdom. If hobbies, extracurricular things, schooling, all of these opportunities that we have out there become the primary objective of our life, what we've done is raise them to a level where they have an umbrella over the person and work of God. And friends, that's idolatry. And it can happen very simply and very easily. It becomes a distraction and our heart is given away. Please understand, I believe the, the call of the missional objective of Christ is simply this to keep the main thing the main thing. You've heard it said before, not to major in the minors. Oh, by the way, I stand before you on behalf of the church, and I confess our sin as a church to you today. I confess that this is not just a problem that individuals have, but rather the institutional church has as well. That we've taken our eye off of the missional objective of Christ and we've started to major in the minors. We become a church of warring factions over this issue or that issue. 
And what's happened is the issue has become more important in the church than the call of Christ. We've started to sit on different sides of the aisle. And even though we are united at the foot of Christ in compassion and love with one another, we don't see it that way anymore. And so we go to conferences. And so we go to meetings. And we take up proverbial swords one one against another to fight over issues while we don't even care about the people in our community who don't yet know the love of Jesus Christ. Today is World Communion Sunday. As a church, do we understand that those brothers and sisters who live in India, those brothers and sisters who live in Russia, those brothers and sisters who live in China in the midst of oppression, in North Korea where you can't even own a Bible, are our brothers and sisters that they gather at the same communion table of grace that we gather at today. Do we understand the missional objective of Christ, and have we given our hearts solely and completely to him? On this day, I urge out this challenge of repentance. We must repent. I must repent. The church must repent. Anything that takes us away from sharing the love of Christ, the forgiveness of sin, the hope of eternal life, anything that would distract us or deceive us from that must be repented of. Anything that would cause us to be anything less than a disciple experiencing the full calling of Christ to share love and grace and hope with the world has become an idol. And we must repent and return back to the first love, the love of Christ. On this morning, we join at a table of grace. And although our tables are in many different places, scattered throughout our community, and often even today on this video, throughout the United States, we are one. And I think it's beautiful on this World Communion Sunday that we experience a scattered Eucharist. Because as a a, a communion of saints here in this world, we are a scattered body on every continent, in every country, all throughout the globe. Today, we can return to our missional objective to be not lukewarm, but to take on the cause of Christ and to share his love with the world. And so this morning, I invite you now, in a sign of repentant heart and right spirit with God, to prepare your communion elements as together we approach the table of grace.